The following program is brought to you by Total Theater Online. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the staff or management of WGBB. You're listening to the station that serves your community, 1240 WGBB. And now it's time for Dave's Gone By with David Lefkowitz. There goes the neighborhood. Welcome, everybody, to this august edition of Dave's Gone By. One solid hour, minus three minutes, of talk radio, comedy, and music, brought to you by Togo Theater and its flagship publication, Performing Arts Insider. It's Thursday, August 5th. The end of summer is in the air. Actually, it's not really in the air. It's as warm and muggy now as it's been since the start, but it's in the air waves on TV with all the back-to-school commercials and the fall fashion outfits and summer clearance sales. It's bad enough kids have to start buying book covers and protractors a month before school commences. But have you seen QVC and uh, HSN? They're selling Christmas ornaments, little doll houses for Santa and Yuletide decorations for your chimney. I mean, I understand merchants don't want to wait until the last minute to count on holiday sales. But isn't July 25th just a little premature to be hawking crap you won't need until December 25th? I've ranted about all this before, of course, the encroaching of Christmas onto the fall calendar, like a malignant cancer turning all the other holidays red, white, and green. Mostly green. It used to be Christmas season started after Thanksgiving. Then it began after Halloween. Now it begins with Columbus Day. But on TV, thank you, Barry Diller, it starts the first day of summer camp. Remember the old Crazy Eddie commercials? How nutty, how absurd, Christmas in August, how insane. Except now, it's the norm. Just wait until 2008 when pre-Christmas shopping starts January 2nd. But I'm not here to rant about these Xmas extremes. I really just wanted to say that it's been a strange summer in some ways. In fact, I just saw my second fire this week. Not the second fire in a week, the second fire of the season that I saw with my own eyes. And remember, it has not been an especially blazing or dry summer. I think since June I've watered the lawn twice. And it's still green because every couple of days we get another rainstorm. It's annoying and probably bad for areas prone to mosquitoes, but it's been great for vegetation especially compared to the year before, when you could spritz the lawn with enough water to drown ten spalding grays, and the grass was still the color of a toasted English muffin. This year, nature has been doing all the work, and yet two fires relatively near where I live. And they're not just little, oops, too much grease in the firing pan fires, but big, devastating call in the investigators conflagrations. A few weeks ago, I was with my wife and mother-in-law in Cedarhurst, and we're shopping, looking around. They're jonesing for Starbucks, and I'm drooling past Zomics. And then the air changed very quickly. And I walked one more block down Central Avenue, and suddenly, fire engines, cop cars, and then black smoke pouring out of the building. And people kind of hanging around, rubbernecking, quizzical, police-directing traffic. It was a fire in the printing room of the Nassau Herald wouldn't have been that big a deal to manage. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of paper there to burn. But the firemen would have contained it, except a propane tank exploded, and that just caused exponential problems. I think it took about four hours to completely get out. And the newspaper never missed an issue. Other businesses in the area loaned office space, computers, physical labor. But it was just so odd how you can be walking down the street, completely oblivious, and then one block later, it's like you're in a whole other gray, unnatural world. And it happened again this weekend, late Friday night. My wife and I are trying to get, get to sleep. We've got the air conditioner on, and Joyce is like, you smell smoke? And I'm like, no, not at all. Go to sleep. And five minutes later, she says, I smell smoke. So I go to the window, and lo and behold, there's police cruisers and fire trucks massing along West Broadway. So, of course, i got to play Big Macho Man. I put on my big boy shorts and say, Stay here. You stay. Me go. Me watch fire. I head downstairs, and my dogs, great watchdogs, and there's a giant fire a block and a half away. They're sleeping. 
This makes me feel really secure about their protected instincts. Fire doesn't wake them up. Me walking downstairs, this wakes them up. One starts sniffing the air, the other wants to play catch. And I'm like, thank you boys, go back to sleep. I'll wake you when the burglar wants to share a sandwich. So I head outside, and first of all, I'm relieved because the fire turns out not to be on our block, but three blocks down. And sheer curiosity carries me in that direction. I pass a cop directing traffic on the corner, and for no reason, no reason at all, I keep walking. Meanwhile, the smoke is getting thick in the air, and it looked like the street does ten seconds before a rainstorm, just so dark and foreboding and heavy with something bad. Although, of course, rain would have been a godsend, but I kept walking. I mean, I'm not the only one. People from the area, a neighbor from our block, and the air is getting worse. And I keep walking. And kids from the neighborhood are still clustering around the 24-hour in and out that's about half a block from the fire. I mean, instead of sitting outside and smoking and sharing six-packs, they're just walking around, gawking, gazing, giving each other looks of, oh, pretty cool, huh? I couldn't even get that far, because at that point, the ash was so thick in the air, you couldn't see three feet past your face. And it suddenly dawned on me, what the hell am I doing? I'm walking into fire. I mean, not really, but the horrible residue, the ash, the chemicals, the smoke, the heat. Why the hell am I walking towards this? What sick mechanism of human nature pushes us to explore disaster even at our own peril. So I turn around. I head home. Now I think to myself, what was I going to do? Was I going to help cheer on the fire department? Look for some sneaky guy with a match and lighter fluid running the other way? And I start walking faster, thinking, why in God's name did I leave the house? And as I reach my corner, I see my next door neighbor. And he's in a t-shirt and night clothes, carrying his two-year-old. And they're on the way to the fire. So I'm like, dude, what are you doing? There's nothing to see. Literally, you get past a certain point, all there is is smoke. You really want your kid breathing that. And wisely, he turns around, and we both walk back together. And his wife is waiting at the door, and mine is downstairs with the dogs. And I think, what a weird suburban moment. This throwback, probably to caveman days, when the man of the house goes out and defends his home against impending calamity, only now it's all for show. Now it's, well, yes, I went to see the fire. It was definitely a fire, and it's under control, and I deserve respect and admiration and testosterone points, because I, um, I went for a walk. I nodded to a policeman. Yes, I did. I could have avoided eye contact, but then there was definitely a mutual nod there. And although I was gone all the five minutes, you can smell the soot and sediment on my clothes and skin and hair. Big man, come home. Initiation over. You know, like, like a man called Horse, I passed the fire distant observation test. Who knows what the next ordeal will be? The death-defying wait-for-dishwasher repairman test. The harrowing stand-behind-old-lady-a-key-food crucible. No, but... In all seriousness, I will say that whatever I was supposed to get out of the experience of walking towards a fire, I did come away with, well, of course, greater respect for firemen, because we know it's hot and dangerous, but it's just so dark and confusing, and you're breathing in such heat and toxins. And it also gave me just an inkling, a tiny window into what downtown New York must have been like on that unforgettable day three years ago. Imagine running through that with a building coming down behind you. Imagine inhaling the remnants of paper, fuel, plastics, vinyl, and human bodies for weeks. Happily, no one was killed or hurt in either local fire, and I hope to hell there aren't any others. I don't recall the five towns being so dangerous years ago. We have these big fires. Two women were killed by a motorist on Peninsula Boulevard a couple of months ago. You had that guy murdered in Lindbrook last year. They finally caught the five Hispanic gang members from Freeport who did it. And last week, some kid led police on a chase from Hewlett to Lindbrook. The kid took out a gun, and then, well, if you want to hear the rest of that story, 
Stick around, because it will be part of a different segment of this program, The News Gone By. That's where we take a look at current events of the week and put our own sarcastic spin on them, Dave style. And who's Dave? I'm Dave. Dave Lefkowitz, radio personality, theater critic, humorist, and journalist, bringing you smart talk, silly talk, special talk, and music every Thursday night at 7. We've had some cool guests the past couple of weeks. Actress and comedian Andrea Kolb. Last week it was jazz musician Dustin Ehrlich. And this week, another good friend. Someone I spoke of on this program back in April when I did a show dedicated to Indian musician Jaji Singh because we had gone that week to see him in concert in New Jersey. I had so much fun telling the story of that odyssey, going to New Jersey, finding a restaurant, fighting the traffic, and then seeing this unusual concert, well, unusual for someone who's used to Western rock and folk music performances, that I never actually got to interview my friend, my wife's friend, actually. Her name is Diditi Mitra, and she's a professor of sociology. She got her doctorate at Temple University, and now teaches at a small suburban college in New Jersey, and her dissertation was about a pretty interesting subject, the lives and networks of Indian cab drivers in New York. How do they get here? How do they get started? How do they cope with language gaps, racism, not having their families in this country? It's what we don't think about when we hop in a cab and see these people just long enough to give them directions and pay them at the end of the ride. Ms. Mitra took a real qualitative look at what social networks and support systems these guys have that get them through the very real pressures and dangers of life in New York. So if all you hear about immigrants is what's coming out of Farmingdale and the fear of a day laborer planet, you probably want to give a listen to my interview with the DT Mitra that's coming up in just a few minutes. And before that, the weekly feature Inside Broadway. A quick look at what's happening on and off Broadway courtesy of Performing Arts Insider. So, much lies ahead tonight, most of it suitable for family listening, but just in case a risque joke or raised earbrow slips by, please remember that this program is rated DGB-13. Parents are cautioned, but not very strongly. And remember, too, that if you're having trouble hearing us, if your signal is weak or staticky on WGBB, you can listen live streaming on the internet via davesgoneby.com. Just click on the link that brings you to the radio station website and listen live through your computer, davesgoneby.com. The fun begins in less than two minutes. Don't go away. On Friday night, I listen to Bonnie D. Graham. On GBB at 6 o'clock, that's where I am. She gives you lots of tips on romance and amour, like how to pick up guys without being a whore. Then Saturday, it's Mr. Redman's music show. At 7.30, it's where new musicians go. And then at 9, it's time for zany comedy, hosted by two young guys named Mikey and Jimmy. GBB is the radio star. 12.40 a.m. is where we are. Dave's good boy on Thursday night. Music and jokes with satirical bite. Also on Thursdays if you're looking for some fun. At 6 o'clock tune in to Larry Davidson. And then on Tuesday if you're looking for light jazz. At 9 p.m. that's just what Mike Shamari has. And don't forget on Sunday night it's Joe Sell's own. For right wing politics is really quite well known. He's on at 7 with his own take on the news. And just like Davey does a bunch of interviews. Shady Day is the radio star. AM 1240, that's where we are. So many shows, so give them a try. They're almost as good as Dev's gone by. GBB is the radio star. GBB is the radio star. GBB is the radio star. Inside Broadway, brought to you by Total Theater's Performing Arts Insider, your everything theater guide. So many times when I mention older actors on this program, it's for obituaries, one last farewell. But sometimes the star is very much alive and well and busy. 
It was back in 1979 that Mickey Rooney made a surprise comeback in the Broadway smash Sugar Babies. That took him to London and a whole later life career in other theater roles, including playing the wizard in that Madison Square Garden Wizard of Oz a couple of years back. But now is a chance to catch Joe Yule Jr., a.k.a. Mickey McGuire, a.k.a. Mickey Rooney, in a more intimate setting, off-Broadway's Irish Repertory Theater. That's where the pint-sized legend and his wife, Jan Chamberlain, will bring his autobiographical review from August 10th to September 12th. It's the whole Mickey Rooney story, albeit, I assume, a more sanitized one than told in his 1991 autobiography, Life is Too Short. Rooney's been working on the show for several years now, in different venues and for different corporate events. He and Jan will sing some songs, from standards to Mickey's own compositions. He'll tell some funny anecdotes, and of course, take audiences through his 80-year career in show business, from being accidentally discovered during his dad's vaudeville routine, to all the legendary women in his life. The title of the evening? What else could he have called it but Let's Put On A Show? And it's at the Irish Rep on West 22nd Street the rest of the summer. Want to know more? Subscribe to Performing Arts Insider Theatre Magazine. A bible of the industry for more than 60 years, Performing Arts Insider gives you all the information, all the scoops, all the dish. People in the television, film, and theater industry rely on Performing Arts Insider for all their contact information and scheduling. And you should rely on it when planning the shows you want to see on and off Broadway. A monthly subscription to Performing Arts Insider costs $160 a year. Expensive, but worth it. Mention Dave's Gone By and get 20% off the regular price. That's $32 off now through August 31st, 2004. Just try one issue of Performing Arts Insider for only $10. Again, sale price limited time. Call 516-295-1511. 516-295-1511. Or visit TotalTheater.com and click on Performing Arts Insider. Next week on Inside Broadway, we'll say Happy Birthday Hairspray. But let's not forget a birthday this week. The off-Broadway musical A Stoop on Orchard Street, which turns one year old this Saturday, August 7th. The show which plays at a theater on the Lower East Side, tells of the hard lives of Jewish immigrants in that very location nearly a hundred years ago. The show's writer and composer, Jay Kolos, was a guest on Dave's Gone By a few months back. He told me the show was loosely based on the experiences of his grandfather, who came through Ellis Island and lived briefly in downtown New York. Kolos said, quote, Some critics have said the show was a little schmaltzy, a little sentimental, that's what the story is about. And we keep packing them in, so we got to be doing something right. If you want to see for yourself, visit the Mazer Theater on East Broadway and help a stoop on Orchard Street usher in its second year. And we'll usher in a new edition of Inside Broadway next week. We've just been Inside Broadway from Performing Arts Insider and TotalTheater.com. Hey, Dave's Gone By listeners, if you like hearing me, you'll love reading me even more. So hurry and get my book, Marriage, Babies, and the End of the World, filled with hilarious plays that were performed in New York like King Solomon the Wise and Blind Date. 232 pages of Pure Dave, only $20 hardcover, $12 trade paperback. To get your copy, call 516-295-1511 or visit my website. Italian, Italian, Chinese, pizza, diner, Italian. You'd figure Long Island would have a wider selection. At least there's a really good Indian place, the Tondor Grill, 222 Sunrise Highway in Rockville Center. Entrees of chicken, fish, lamb, vegetarian, and if you mention Dave's Gone By, you get 10% off the bill. Open daily for lunch and dinner, the Tondor Grill, 516-766-4440. Something different, something good. 
Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on AM 1240 WGBB Freeport and AM 1240 WGBB.com. A uh, segment I like to call Dave's Got Guests. Well, one guest anyway, very special guest, friend of uh, my wife's for quite a few years now, a friend of mine too. Her name is Diditi Mitra, and she's been in this country since 1986, originally from Calcutta, and so has a you know, some rather interesting memories to share about uh, her growing up in India, and also uh, about a culture that we kind of take for granted in this country and often make fun of, or at least if you're Jackie Mason, the whole Indian cab driver thing. We have this set batch of stereotypes, and yet we rely on them to, to get us around, and we, we see them everywhere and see them eating in, you know, little Indian restaurants just as they jump into their cabs and and change gas, but, you know, there's a whole real life and real people behind that, and hopefully we'll get a glimpse into that culture from our friend Diditi. So, Diditi Mitra, welcome to Dave's Gone By. Thank you. So, again, you, you came to this country in 86, but until then you were in Calcutta, that's where you were born? Yeah, I've born and lived all my life in Calcutta, yep. So, what are your earliest memories of growing up there? Some of my memories are just hanging around in the neighborhood growing up as a teenager. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, making friends in the neighborhood and uh, hanging out with them and sometimes lying to my parents, going down to the movies without telling them. I assume this was not when you were four years old. No, <laughs> not when I was four. No, but I was like, well, 12. I was an eighth grader, remember? Well, there, there's actually, you know, Indian movies are coming into some kind of uh, renaissance now. We're seeing more and more, you know, that there, that's happening. What Do you love Indian cinema? Yes, I love the Hindi movies with all its problems. I love them because they are, I think, escapist in a lot of ways. And I, you know, the Indian, the Hindi music, which is part of the cinema, mm -hmm. is really um, what a lot of people listen to. So that's and now it's changing a little bit because with pop music and non-film music becoming part of the mainstream. But in terms of mainstream songs, I think that's where a lot of the songs come from. So I do enjoy it, and it's, it's colorful and. Most of it is a little escapist. It can get a little boring, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I do like it. Um, there was a scene, I, I didn't see the whole movie, but uh, early in The Guru, you see the little kid, uh, he's watching one, you know, basic classic type Indian musical, and he sneaks over to another uh, cinema in the multiplex, and he watches Grease with John Travolta, Travolta and Olivia Newton-John with the Hindi subtitles instead. Mm -hmm. Did you have some of that growing up? Where, was there like... The, the thrill of an American movie coming through also, and were they significantly different? Oh, yeah. I mean, I do remember seeing Grease when I was, I think, I don't know, 8th grade. Mm -hmm. I did see that Grease with uh, Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta, and um, that's also a very class thing where those in the middle and the upper classes watch uh, Hollywood movies, too. I mean, I also remember watching with my father the, a lot of the westerns with Yul Brenner and uh, oh, wow. Magnificent Seven and... Uh, were they dubbed or just subtitled? No, they were in English. They were not subtitled. Oh, oh. So at what point were you taught English just naturally in like elementary school or? No, I uh, was taught English. Uh, oh gosh, two and a half, three years old. By in school. Yeah, in school. Yeah, in school. So I learned English pretty early. So it's uh, something that you know I learned simultaneously with other languages. Was, was there any kind of resentment of that, of that being still part of the whole English caste, and, well, not caste system, but certainly the uh, the whole English colonial system, the holdover of that, or was it just very natural for most people in India to speak English as well as their dialect? Well, I mean, with the English, again, there's a class element to it, too, where in the middle and the upper classes generally tend to uh, speak English and tend to value English. As, and have all these uh, meanings attached to English as, you know, a much more polished uh, way of speaking or, you know, much more people who speak English and wear jeans and pants are just more sophisticated. And so there are those influences um, that are still very dominant and very much part of um, the culture in India, at least the urban, middle, and the upper classes. So in terms of resentment, no, I remember, I mean, now I feel a little foolish growing up, you know, publicly speaking English to make myself present, I mean, to make myself look so good and superior in front of those who did not speak English. So that was, you know, and when I think back to that and I realize that how um, much of an influence uh, 
the past continues to have on the present. And so, no, there was no resentment, certainly not. And when you came over here, first of all, what were, was the reasoning behind it, and was there a big culture shock for you? coming? Did you come right to New York, or, or how did that all come about? Um, I actually had come to visit in the summer months of 86 with my parents, my aunt who was living in Richmond Hill, Queens since 1972. Mm -hmm. And um, I had plans on coming here as a student, as most of the urban upper middle class people do, and you know, going and studying abroad, so I was certainly um, had one of those goals, especially with my aunt being here. And um, I had taken this test called the test of English language as a, English as a foreign language called TOEFL the year before, mm -hmm. because I was in 11th grade, and I was like, okay, it's time to apply for colleges. And I just happened to visit, and I had my TOEFL scores with me, and my aunt said, well, since you're here and you've taken the TOEFL, well, why don't we go see if we, you can get into high school? And uh, Christ the King Regional High School, which is where I met Joyce, actually. Joyce, my wife. Yes, and um, that's where um, you know I started school, and my aunt just said, just stay here. They admitted me in the fall of uh, 86, 12th and grade, and um, I stayed on. So that's how it all started. And you lived with your aunt for a few years until, I guess, college years, or? Yeah, till 91, so it's since, uh, until I finished college, and then I moved to New Brunswick, uh, to Rutgers, I was there till 94, and then I moved to Philadelphia to go to Temple from 94 to... Um, Te I Temple being Temple University, not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> being converted no, to Judaism and, and rushed to a synagogue in, in Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. No, certainly not. And then in 2002 is when I finished my degree, and now I'm living in Jersey again. I'm loving it. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. So what was the biggest appreciable difference for you? I mean, you were young, mm -hmm. high school age, when you made the real switch. But mm -hmm. um, between Indian life, city Indian life, you, you were urban, mm -hmm. and um, and America, Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things that helped was knowing the language, but I did not necessarily understand the accent. So I remember that being a fear. It was almost as if I didn't know the language. So that was one thing. So I wouldn't answer telephones because I didn't know what the person on the other side would be saying because I didn't understand the language. I was fearful of the telephone. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, over a while I got over it. Well, and, tell the eraser story. Um, the eraser story, yes. That was one one uh, other story. Well, I was in school. It was an art class. And in India... Uh, eraser is called a rubber and we were sitting around and I don't know Joyce was happened to be there I know she wasn't in class I don't know why she was there she was sitting next to me and asked her for a rubber and she understood what I meant <laughs> yeah and so she said well why don't you ask Laura Laura was sitting way across from the table and I'm very lazy so instead of getting up and walking over to her and asking her for a rubber oh god I just happened to yell it across the table and I Rubber and Laura looks at me in a strange way, and Joyce Ann is sitting next to me, smirking. Smirking? Knowing my wife, she was probably laughing you know, hysterically. <laughs> she was like, oh, my God, I, I got her in trouble. <laughs> and that was certainly the purpose. And, uh, and, and, then, and did Laura give you a rubber? <laughs> <laughs> she said, for later, baby, but oh. not right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, I, I want to take the second half of this interview. Okay. And talk about, uh, you have your doctorate, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you. A, a lovely doctorate from Temple? Yes. In? In sociology. Sociology, which is what my wife is, is getting her doctorate in as well yes. over at, at Fordham. What was your uh, dissertation on? Uh, I researched Indian taxi drivers in New York City. And specifically, was there, there a, something you were trying to find out about them, or was it just a slice of their lives? No, I was actually trying to find out why they drive taxis in New York City, what were some of the factors that led them to, to you know, and, do that. And what did you discover? Well, there were a few things. Um, I looked at the relationships that they had with the other Indian taxi drivers or other taxi drivers in general and found out that most of their relationships were with other Indian taxi drivers or were taxi drivers at one point or planned to be. And uh, I looked at... Um, the ways that the fleet garages in the city, the mm -hmm. fleet garages are places where the drivers go to lease their taxis. The drivers are independent contractors and they lease their taxis for, at the time, this was in the summer of 2000, anywhere the lease was from 80 to 110. 
um, that they have to pay a fund. Uh, so I talked to the managers and owners of those fleet garages, find out what they were doing that increased the proportion of Indian drivers in the city because uh, there was a very high proportion of Indian taxi drivers in New York City, mm -hmm. um, which was the reason why I wanted to explore the topic. So I looked at the owners of the garages and I looked at changes in the patterns of uh, Indian immigration to the United States, particularly in the last 20 to 30 years. Has it grown exponentially? Yes, it, it changes in terms of the socioeconomic background of the immigrants who are coming to the United States. So particularly since 1960s to 2000, how that has changed and whether that had anything to do with the high proportion of taxi drivers we see in the city. You can say, well, a taxi, you can get, as long as you have a driver's license, you get a hack license, and then it's a job that you can get, you know, seemingly. I, I assume that's part of it when immigrants are coming in. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are other reasons why so many of them went for this profession rather than barber college mm -hmm. or uh, restaurants or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. When... A lot of the taxi drivers, at least the ones that I interviewed, they were largely coming from rural backgrounds. They were primarily of a uh, farming background, of lower socioeconomic background, um, who did not really know English very well, but certainly has a, had a grasp, somewhat of a grasp of the English language, so which made it easier for this group to opt for taxi because then you know they could understand what the passenger was saying and take those tests right. that he had mm -hmm. to take to take the hack license. Uh, it's one of the things um, that is the easy thing to do. As you said, you know, you have have a driver's license and then all you have to do is take these exams. And um, But uh, they cost money, four to $500, I believe, to get a hack license. Um, there's some fees. Um, restaurants um, is something that they may plan to do. So initially, because it takes a lot of capital to start a restaurant business, so, um, you know, once they drive cabs, their goal, at least for the sample, was to uh, make enough money so that they could save up and then maybe in the future invest in restaurants or even buy gas stations or, um, you know, small grocery stores. So I think that one of the reasons that they chose for taxi is one that, you know, the networks that they were coming into were already cab drivers. So the people that they were familiar with knew this industry really well and knew how to um, get their co-ethnic, their relatives or friends into driving taxis. Mm -hmm. And two, it was, it is a profession that does not require an uh, elaborate set of, well, a different, a set, a set of skills, um, you know, that does not require high levels of education. So even if somebody knows somewhat some English and uh, can drive, um, they can do this job. It's a tough job, but it's something that is accessible in that way. Did um, you hear, I mean, how, how large was your sample, by the way? How many people did you talk to? Uh, the taxi drivers I spoke with, 40 Indian taxi drivers, uh, 10 non-Indian taxi oh. drivers, 8 owners uh, or managers of garages, and 2 activists of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. So about hmm. 60. So, 60 folks. So yeah. have they... Were their experiences as a whole positive, or is it all a way station for them, or do they end up not really even making enough to, to put down uh, enough money to go to the next level of the so-called American dream that they want, or are they sending a lot of money home to relatives and friends who are making you know $3 an hour you know out in Pakistan or, or, in, uh, or in India? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a good question. It's something that I think that future research needs to explore, that what happens to these people, are they really being able to save? But given the people that I talked with, to me it would seem like a difficult dream to achieve, given that a lot of them have to pay off their loans that they took out in order to migrate. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money from relatives or other people. Um, secondly, the amount of money that my sample was making really was um, around maybe between twenty four to thirty two thousand dollars a year, and then they're supporting families. Uh, now, is that twenty four you know they're clearing that kind of money after whatever the yeah well they told me this is what they made in a week, so it also could be uh, that they're also paying their leases out of the money that they're earning right um, and this is before or after their taxes after it was after taxes, yeah, so somewhere in the twenty four to thirty yeah. something range yeah. Were there any amazing anecdotes or stories that you were told about, you know, their experiences? Well, I mean, not 
really, I mean, I, I know that the drivers, you know, are, uh, are mugged, have the risk of that happening, being robbed. Do they all hate police? Actually, a good proportion of them talked about the kind of disrespect they receive from the police as well as the passengers. However, they also say, you know, there's good police, bad police, good police, good passenger, bad passenger. However, they have, um, they, they are a little afraid of the police in a way that they feel insulted whenever they violate traffic laws. Um, they've been uh, threatened with deportation. They have been uh, cursed out by the police. Uh, they believe that they receive higher tickets as cab drivers and then as uh, Indian cab drivers, that they feel that their targets are racism by the police. And you mentioned there's some kind of union happening? Yeah, there is um, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance uh, in um, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. They feel that the wages aren't sufficient. They, or at least in 2000, they felt that the wages are, uh, weren't sufficient. And I know there's a push right now towards livable wage of taxi drivers. There's a petition that's going around for that. They also feel that the traffic laws are just too uh, severe for them. They feel that the Taxi Limousine Commission gives them too many tickets and that when the drivers go to contest those tickets, it's really uh, no use because inevitably the drivers end up losing. Um, mm -hmm. And they feel that there are charges of you know, uh, racism as well um, that uh, shape the experiences of the drivers. Here's one thing that I, I actually don't know about. Like, I, you get into a New York City yellow cab, mm -hmm. and it's like $2 during the day for a drop or two fifty at night, and then whatever else, whatever's on the meter plus tip. Mm -hmm. What goes to the cabbie? What goes to the the owner, you know, the, the mm -hmm. cab company? Uh, well, as you know, as independent uh, contractors, they can't, um, they are not eligible for health benefits because they're not employers of the, garages, for example, that they lease the taxis from. So they don't get that. Um, they also have to pay the lease fee up front, usually. Mm. Um, that's, as I said, at the time was between 80 and 110. Um, they also have to pay for gasoline. They also have to, you know, pay for their food, of course. Right, but in other words, of the money that the passenger mm -hmm. hands in mm -hmm. when the, the ride is over, mm -hmm. what percentage, I, I assume they keep the whole tip, mm -hmm. Well, what, what about the actual drop money and, and the money of the wheel spinning? Mm -hmm. Does that all go elsewhere and they only keep the tip, or what's the deal with no, that? No, no, no. They are just giving the garages the lease money, and they have to pay for gasoline. I think they have to return their taxes with a full tank, I believe. So. Right, but other than that, they basically keep... The whatever. rest, yes. Oh, okay. I, I did not realize that. Yes. I gotcha. Okay, and then from that, they pay a certain fee to the... A lease fee and and the gas and all that. Right. Okay. And and for maintenance and and um, fix it stuff. No. If, stuff. if they're leasing it from the garage, then they don't have to take care of maintenance. However, some of the drivers that I spoke with also owned medallions. Right. Uh, and in that case, they're the owner of of the cabs as well, and so then they have to take care of their maintenance stuff. But when they're leasing from the garages, no. One last question. Um. After having done that study and that, and that dissertation, what was the one most surprising thing, if any, that you, know, you didn't realize, that you learned about the life of, of an Indian New York City cab driver? Mm -hmm. The incredible networks. I've read about networks in immigration journals and other journals, but the incredible uh, reciprocity among the cab drivers, that, and secondly, um, the, how insular the community is from larger America. Hmm. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Uh, on both of them or just one? Well, uh, specifically how they, they keep, I wouldn't say keep to themselves, mm -hmm. but, but I guess that is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, their community, their friends, I don't remember any one person who did not have a um, Punjabi or at least, you know, a South Asian friend, but they were primarily, because they're coming in as networks and, and they're completely insular to the entire um, country, uh, partly that's a function of, I think, the fact that, you know, they don't feel included, um, they feel isolated, uh, they don't feel so comfortable with the culture, they also feel disrespected, you know, as poor people or working class people and um, as non-whites. So they are completely insular. Um, and it's, it, to me that was amazing because I obviously have a different experience living in this country 
as opposed to the taxi drivers. And here we are from the same part of the country, I mean, the, the same country, all the different parts, mm -hmm. and yet have such different experiences. And to me, it was a function of, I think, when I came, the people I met, the spaces that were uh, that I was in as a result of the school I went to and the people I met. Uh, whereas for this group of people, they were coming in to meet other friends, but also because of the socioeconomic background and who they were, there was there seemed to me to be a greater um, distance from the larger America. And I'm sure that that happens for the other classes of South Asians coming in as well. But I think for others, if you're you know working. Um, as a professor, you're working as a computer specialist, so there's a greater contact as a result of the working space. So there's some interaction that happens. But for these cab drivers, they are working, you know, in their cab is their workspace, and they really don't have the opportunity to meet other people. So they tend to become more insular as a result. At least that's what I think. Well, I want to thank you, Diditi Mitra, for not being insular about this topic. <laughs> Uh, that was what a lousy segue <laughs> into the outro. I mean, it, it's outsular because it's bringing us to out of this segment. But I, I want to thank you very, very much, actually, for telling us a little bit about your life and, and about the life of the people that you've looked at and studied. And I want to wish you best of luck um, in teaching and, and continuing to learn from and with America. Thanks so much. Didi thank Kimitra. You. Thank you very much. Do you know how easy and inexpensive it is to advertise on days gone by? You don't? Well, hey, it's even easier to find out. You can run a 30 or 60 second ad or sponsor one of the segments on this show or the whole show. Just go to our website, hometown.aol.com forward slash days gone by to see the rate sheet or call 516-295-1511. Bring your message to my audience, advertise on days gone by. Oh my god, the wedding is next month. We need flyers, invitations, booklets. Irving, we are screwed. No, we're not, Pearl. We'll just go to Hewlett Minuteman Press. Hewlett Minuteman? What can I do? Printing, engraving, really? letterhead, souvenirs. Wonderful. Are they still at 1315 Broadway in Hewlett? Yep. 516-569-5577. Well, stop dawdling. Let's go. Yes, dear. Day after the wedding, I kill her. My radio's on, the news is all bad, but it's good to relax. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on this Thursday, August 5th, 2004. Time for the news gone by. A look at events of the past week from the heights of August to the depths of disgust. In Homeland Security news, President Bush said that he wants to appoint a counterterrorism czar to link the FBI, CIA, and Defense Department. Asked what this person would do, Bush said his main job is to gather intelligence, kind of the opposite of what my brain does. In financial news, America's post-recession economic recovery continues, but it remains bedeviled by glass-half-full, glass-half-empty reports. Unemployment seems to have stabilized, manufacturing has strengthened, and consumer confidence has returned. Unfortunately, so has inflation, with oil prices at an all-time high, and a federal deficit to match $477 billion of debt, the third straight shortfall after four straight years of surpluses under Clinton. Training the budget the most is not the war, which costs a mere $90 billion, but Medicare, which eats up $300 billion a year. Addressing this issue, President Bush has finally come up with a solution. Starting next year, the American military will reinstate the draft, but only for people 75 and over. Elderly men and women will be shipped off to Iraq, where the bloated military budget will feed them, clothe them, and provide for all their health care needs. And best of all, the oldest, most infirm, and frail will be trained as minesweepers, which provides both physical exercise and welcome euthanasia. Interesting item in New York Magazine this week, boxing promoter Don King came out in political support for George W. Bush. He's campaigning for the president's re-election, saying that the Democrats talk a good game about black empowerment, but they don't do anything. 
whereas Bush is strong on the fence and has high-level blacks in his cabinet. Plus, those tax cuts aren't too bad for King's empire either. Asked whether Don King was the kind of role model the administration wants in its corner, a spokesperson said, look, Don King is a convicted murderer, a thief, and a fraud. He can work for us anytime. Tragic news from Dix Hills, Long Island this week. A four-year-old boy was killed in a freak accident. He was waiting for the bus to take him and his sister home from day camp when a rotted branch from the tree he was sitting under fell on his head and killed him. Officials say the camp is blameless, although they are holding the tree in custody. They say it was a simple revenge motive. The tree saw the little boy reading a book and realized it was made out of his cousin. In news of the animal kingdom, Queen's residents had a surreal moment last Saturday when Apollo, a 450-pound white tiger, escaped from the Cole Brothers Circus. The animal strolled through a local park and was apprehended while sauntering down the Jackie Robinson Parkway. Although rubbernecking caused a four-car pileup, there were no other incidents, and the beast remained perfectly calm until its capture. Police said they would have shot the animal if it had made its way to Shea Stadium. After all, since the Mets are routinely beaten by Cardinals, Marlins, and Cubs, how on earth could they deal with Tigers? Well, if you think the New York subway system leaves a lot to be desired, just look at last week's controversy about the London Underground. Officials for the UK's transit system approved an ad campaign which acknowledged that trains and platforms can be overcrowded and overheated. But that's not the contentious part. The advertisement begs commuters, quote, please don't eat smelly food while riding on the tube. In fact, the poster shows a fat Mediterranean-looking man sitting under an array of meats, sausages, and bags of garlic. The Italian embassy immediately complained, saying, quote, we consider this poster to be very offensive to the Italian image and Italian products, unquote. And yes, the underground did pull the ads, and they apologized to the Italian community. In fact, they're planning a new ad campaign that encourages eating smelly Italian meat on the subway. The tagline, Italy, they make the trains give you the runs on time. From Italy and England, we move to Germany where road rage takes all kinds of forms and situations. In Berlin, a truck driver beat the bratwurst out of a motorist he thought was going too slowly. Germany is extremely lax about its speeding laws, when there are any, and this truck driver got mad that the guy in front of him was going 18 miles an hour in an 18 mile an hour zone. The trucker is facing a stiff sentence not only for losing his temper, but for being the first German in history to engage in brutality when he wasn't following orders. In celebrity news, congratulations to actor Nicolas Cage, who tied the knot last week with Alice Kim, a waitress he met at a sushi restaurant. Cage is 40 years old, Kim is 20, which led to some criticism in Hollywood circles, including from Woody Allen who said he felt sorry for Cage because he's already missed out on the best part of marriage, puberty. Congratulations to Thomas Strubler of Austria and Samantha Sayeg of Lebanon. They're the grand champions of karaoke singing, crowned in a four-day contest in Finland last week. Strubler belted Bon Jovi's This Ain't a Love Song. Sayeg wowed the crowd with the theme song to the movie Fame. According to Reuters, each came away with $1,200 and the title of King and Queen of Karaoke. Said one observer, quote, We have enough turmoil in the world. We need this, unquote. Said a more enlightened observer, We have enough turmoil in the world. We need this. And finally, some exciting invention news. After years and years of testing and disappointments, researchers have come up with an effective, non-toxic shark repellent Four ounces dropped in a body of water seems to trigger a terror and flight mechanism, even in sharks driven into a frenzy by the smell of blood. It's an amazing breakthrough because until now, 
the only effective repellent against bloodthirsty sharks was disbarment. And that's the news gone by for August 5th, 2004. Please send your comments, opinions, and tiger balm to Dave's Gone By, P.O. Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062. That's Dave's Gone By, P.O. Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062. Or email me at Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. We reserve the right to read your letters on the air, name withheld upon request. So, drop me a line, zap me an email, express me a package, but please, no karaoke, unless you stay tuned back after this. Oh my god, this is terrible. What? There are 168 hours in a week, but Dave's Gone By is only on one hour long. I know, I'm just on Thursday night. But that's not enough! Why don't you get my CDs? CDs? All my complete shows are on compact disc. $14 a piece or less if you buy a bunch. Just go to davesgoneby.com. Fully packaged and they make a nice gift too. Well, my depression has cleared. Great! But not my psychosis. What chicken is this? Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. Hope you enjoyed the program. I want to thank my special guest, DDT Mitra, for sharing her insights into the lives and livelihoods of Indian cabbies. I want to thank my wife, Joyce, for being my best pal and companion. I want to thank engineers Tom, Trevor, and Dennis for being especially helpful the last couple of weeks as I was getting more involved at the radio station. And you can get more involved in this program in so many ways. Just writing to me, letting me know what you think, what made you laugh, what made you cringe. Dave's Gone By at AOL.com or Snail Mail, Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557. You can also send some money my way, that would be nice. Not for nothing, you get stuff for it, like a CD. We have a whole bunch of past programs on compact disc, just $14 a piece. Or, you can buy my book of plays, available in hardcover or trade paperback, or you can advertise on the show at really reasonable rates. All the information you need is on my website, davesgoneby.com. And for all the theater information you require, remember that Total Theater is offering a discount on Performing Arts Insider magazine through the month of August. 20% off the subscription price or at the current issue for just $10. Visit totaltheater.com to find out more. And don't miss the 10% discounts at my two other sponsors, the Tondor Grill Indian Restaurant in Rockville Center and Hewlett Minuteman Press, copying and printing on Broadway in Hewlett. Mention Dave's Gone By in both places and that's 10% back in your pocket. And speaking of percentages, Dave's Gone By takes up only 0.59% of WGBB's weekly programming. The rest of the schedule has all sorts of shows, from ethnic to religious to community service, but here's a few of special interest to you, starting on Tuesday nights with the instrumental Invasion. Smooth jazz from 9 to 10. Thursdays at 6, it's Larry Davidson hosting the interview show WGBB Tonight. And of course, Dave's Gone By goes on at 7. And then it's the weekend. Time for Bonnie D. Graham on Fridays, 6 to 7, with Long Island's Gigging. You got the Saturday Night Rock Block on GBV with Mr. Redman at 7.30, followed by the Mikey and Jimmy Comedy Show at 9. And Sunday night, my good friend Joe Salzone is back from his vacation, bringing your world to you Sunday nights at 7. A couple of minutes before I go, so I wanted to give you an update on a few guests I've had on the program. Dustin Ehrlich, I mentioned him before, he's the jazz guitarist who was on the show last week. He wrote me a lovely letter, and I quote, I want you to know that it was an absolute pleasure to work on the show with you. I'd like to do it again sometime. You're very professional, if <laughs> he only knew. Uh, and I appreciate that a lot. There are a lot of losers in the entertainment field, and you are at the opposite end of that spectrum or speculum, unquote. Well, thank you, Dustin, for that speculation. Learn more about him and his new CD, A Distant Star, at DustinErlich.com. A reminder also that October Project comes to Joe's Pub on Tuesday, August 10th. Emil Adler, Julie Flanders, Marina Valika, the core of the group, 
Plus, original band members Urbano Sanchez and Dave Sabatino with recent addition Martha Colby on cello. I hope you heard that very special episode we did with Marina, Julie, and Emil a few months back. That was around the time they were doing a loft concert in the village. Now we're at, they are at the swanky but reasonably priced Joe's Pub in the Public Theater building on Lafayette Street. That's this Tuesday. Really, do not miss them. Steve the Whistler Herbst, one of my very first guests, was voted Whistling Entertainer of the Year for the second year in a row at the annual International Whistlers Convention in Lewisburg, North Carolina. He almost won International Male Grand Champion Whistler, but he came in second to some Dutch guy. You'll get him next year, Steve. Art Paul Schlosser, the Milwaukee street musician and painter, who was on our Band of Outsiders episode last fall. He has a new CD out, Words of Cheese and Parrot Trees is the title. He's gotten into this alter ego kind of thing with a character called Buddy Holly Cheesehead. It's a specifically Wisconsin kind of thing, quite popular out there. So Google the name Art Paul Schlosser for tons of info about him. Neil Sadaka is on tour, including next Friday, August 13th, at Westbury Music Fair. Sadaka did a delightful interview with us a couple of weeks ago, talking about his career and his Yiddish music CD. Now he's doing a more traditional pop concert, but I'm sure he'll sneak My Yiddish Mama in there as well. And finally, a big old howdy to the Housewives on Prozac, that fun band who joined us in the studio last December. They'll be putting out a Christmas CD with excerpts from their interview on this show on that disc, so we're all pretty excited about that. It was a really fun segment. Band leader Joy Rose called it, quote, totally Frank Zappa. So, forget the ornaments on HSN and the gingerbread houses on QVC. Be on the lookout for Housewives on Prozac's Christmas CD with me, sometime in the late fall. Time for me to fall back to my non-radio life, but just for six and twenty-three twenty-fourths more days, I'll be back next week, August 12th, for the 89th episode of Dave's Gone By. Until then, okay, release the balloons. The balloons, we need more balloons. Why, why is nothing falling? What the hell are you guys doing up there? Balloons! Uh, all right, we'll just go with the outro. Don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz. Good night. Go confetti. And gone by.
Let it go. 